Shikim Loach is a Hebrew term. In modern Hebrew, it's a colloquialism, but the term itself originates in the Hebrew scriptures. Evid Kim Loach. It is when a slave becomes a master and takes on the character of his old oppressor. We think of the book by George Orwell that I read when I was 13 years old, Animal Farm. The pigs liberated the other animals but became the new oppressor and in certain respects became worse than the old one, or at best the same. Or I think of the South African conqueror who united various localized tribes in what is today KwaZulu-Natal into the Zulu people and Zulu nation, Shaka Zulu. He was born oppressed and poor and socially disfavored, became a tremendous military leader and strategist, but once he got power, he went absolutely crazy with it. A man who began a liberator of the people became their most notorious oppressor. This was Shaka Zulu. He began right, or at least he began with a noble motive to unite and help and empower the people. But what he did when he got the power, again, as has often been said in nomenclature, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is known for many generations by historians and scholars. Well, let's continue looking at this. Evid Kimloach. It doesn't originate with George Orwell, or it doesn't originate with Shaka Zulu. It comes from the scriptures. When someone is oppressed, and God gives them a victory, and takes a lowly person and raises them up, <coughs> if they have not been properly prepared by God for leadership, they become an oppressor themselves. This is true of several of the kings of Israel and Judah in the Old Testament. But in contrast to them, King David would be an exception. Although David was chosen by God to replace King Saul at an early point, it was many years of David being pursued by Saul and persecuted by Saul and writing with the Philistines and all sorts of other things before David was able to assume the position under the anointing of the prophet Samuel from the Lord. This is simply the way it is. You can take a person from an oppressed background and you can make them a champion or a leader or a hero or a liberator or an anything, but don't expect them to be significantly better or even significantly different than that which they replace unless God has prepared them for that position and unless their heart is right before God, not before people, before God. If it's right before God, it will be right before the people automatically. Let's look today at one example. We all know about Congressman Lewis refusing to recognize the legitimacy of Mr. Trump's presidency, even though it was legal and constitutional, even though as a congressman he took an oath to uphold the Constitution, he rejects the legitimacy of a constitutionally elected president. I don't see this president-elect as a legitimate president. You do not consider him a legitimate president. Why is that? I, I think the Russians participated in helping this man get elected, mm -hmm. and they helped destroy the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. Uh, I don't plan to attend inauguration. It would be the first one that I miss. And that's not just not about not attending the inauguration. He rejects the legitimacy. Well, this is Lewis, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis was beaten up at the bridge crossing in Selma, Alabama in 1965 in the Civil Rights Movement. I remember so well the afternoon of March 7, 1965, mm -hmm. we left Brown Chapel Church. It was a silent walk, about 600 of us. Mm -hmm. No one saying a word. We were walking on the sidewalk. I was walking to Jose William uh, from Dr. King's organization. We get to the edge of the bridge. Jose William said, John, can you swim? I said, no. 
And I said, well, there's too much water there. We're not going to jump. We're going ahead. And we continued to walk. We came to the highest point on this bridge. Down below, we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. And at that point, were you afraid for your life, or was it just sort of something that said, keep going, this is about his own? We had to keep going. I, th I thought we were going to be arrested, and that we were going to go to jail, and I was prepared to go to jail. Lewis's and the marchers' fate would be far worse than jail. The Alabama State Troopers unleashed a brutal attack. These images broadcast around the world awaken to the nation's conscience. Well, let's understand what's happened now. This same Mr. Lewis, Congressman Lewis, also refused to accept the legitimacy of George Bush's presidency. You can say it was decided by the Supreme Court and George Bush, his brother was the governor in Florida where the dispute was and Okay, you can say that perhaps about Mr. Bush, but you cannot say it about Mr. Trump constitutionally or legally. But it doesn't stop there. He compared John McCain to George Wallace. He compared John McCain to George Wallace. Now, George Wallace was a Democrat, a member of Mr. Lewis's own party. Mr. McCain and I don't particularly like Mr. McCain personally, but Mr. McCain was a member of the Republican Party. Yet Congressman Lewis compared John McCain to George Wallace, a Southern segregationist who stood on the steps of the university in Alabama and said he wouldn't let black people, including back, black veterans coming back from Vietnam, get an education under the GI Bill. Yes, a minute. Yes, a minute. I am the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. I am here to accompanied by the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and by the Marshal of the Northern District of Alabama. And I have with me here a proclamation signed by the President of the United States which calls upon you to cease obstruction of justice in this state. The proclamation, Governor, was signed by the President within the last hour. I wish to make it clear to you that this is an awfully simple thing we are asking today. It's a routine yes. thing. Yes, it is simply the enforcement of a court order of which you are aware. And I've come here to ask you now for an unequivocal assurance that you will permit these students who, after all, merely want an education at the great university. Well, now, you make your statement, but we don't need you to make a speech. You make your statement. I will make my statement, Governor. I was in the process of making my statement. And I'm asking from you an unequivocal assurance that you will not bar entry to these students, to Vivian Malone and to James Hood, and that you will step aside peacefully and do your constitutional duty as governor of this state and as an officer of the court, which you are as a member of the bar, and that nobody acting under your control will bar their entry physically or by any other means. May I have such an assurance? I have a statement to read. As governor and chief magistrate of the state of Alabama, I deem it to be my solemn obligation and duty to stand before you, representing the rights and sovereignty of this state and its people. The unwelcomed, unwanted, unwarranted, and force-induced intrusion upon the campus of the University of Alabama, the day of the might of the central government, offers frightful example of the oppression of the rights, privileges, and sovereignty of this state by officers the federal government. This intrusion results solely from force or threat of force, undignified by any reasonable application of the principle of law, reason, and justice. It is important that the people of this state and nation understand that this action is in violation of rights reserved to the state by the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Alabama. While some few may applaud these acts, millions of Americans will gaze in sorrow upon the situation existing at this great institution of learning. Only the Congress can make the law of the United States. To this state, no statutory authority can be cited to the people of this country, which authorizes the central government to ignore the sovereignty of this state in an attempt to subordinate the rights of Alabama and millions of Americans. There has been no legislative action by Congress justifying this intrusion. When the Constitution of the United States was enacted, a government was formed upon the premise that people as individuals are endowed with the rights of life, liberty, and property, and with the right of local self-government. 
The people and their local self-government formed a central government and conferred upon it certain and limited powers. All other powers were reserved to the states and to the people. Strong local government is the foundation of our system and must be continually guarded and maintained. Further, as the governor of the state of Alabama, I hold the supreme executive power of this state, and it is my duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed. The illegal and unwarranted actions of the central government on this day, contrary to the laws, customs, and traditions of this state, is calculated to disturb the peace. I stand before you today in place of thousands of other Alabamians whose presence would have confronted you had I been derelict and neglected to fulfill the responsibilities of my office. It is the right of every citizen, however humble he may be, through his chosen officials of, representatives gov of representative government to stand courageously against whatever he believes to be the exercise of power beyond the constitutional rights conferred upon our federal government. It is this right which I assert for the people of Alabama by my presence here today. Again, I state, this is the exercise of the heritage of freedom and liberty under the law, coupled with responsible government. Now, therefore, in consideration of the premises and in my official capacity as governor of the state of Alabama, I do hereby make the following solemn proclamation. Whereas the Constitution of Alabama vests the supreme executive powers of the state and the governor as the chief magistrate, and said Constitution requires of the governor that he take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And whereas the Constitution of the United States, Amendment 10, reserved to the states respectively or to the people, those powers not delegated to the United States, not prohibited to the state. And whereas the operation of the public school system is a power reserved to the state of Alabama under the Constitution of the United States, Amendment 10 thereof. And whereas, whereas it is the duty of the governor of the state of Alabama to preserve the peace under the circumstances now existing, which power is one reserved to the state of Alabama and the people thereof under the Constitution of the United States and Amendment 10 thereof. Now, therefore, I, George C. Wallace, as governor of the state of Alabama, have by my action raised issues between the central government and the sovereign state of Alabama, which said issues should be adjudicated in the manner prescribed by the Constitution of the United States and now being mindful of my duties and responsibilities under the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Alabama, and seeking to preserve and maintain the peace and dignity of this state and the individual freedoms of the citizens thereof, do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. I take it from that uh, statement that uh, you are going to stand in that door and that you are not going to carry out the orders of uh, this court, and that you are going to resist us from doing so. Is that correct? I stand upon the statement. Stand upon that statement. Governor, I'm not interested in a show. I don't know what the purpose of the show is. I am interested in the orders of these courts being enforced. That is my only responsibility here. I ask you once more, the choice is yours. There is no choice that the United States government has in this but to see that the lawful orders of its court are enforced. The consequences of your stand must rest with you. The choice is yours. I would ask you once again to responsibly step aside. And if you do not, I'm going to assure you that the orders of those courts will be enforced. Two students who simply seek an education on this campus are presently on the campus. They have a right to be here, protected by that court order. They have a right to register here. It is a simple problem, scarcely worth this kind of attention, in my judgment. And those students who remain on this campus, they will register today. They will go to school tomorrow, and they will go to school at this university, at this summer session. The university has indicated its willingness to accept them. From the outset, Governor, all of us have known that the final chapter of this would be the admission of these students. I ask you once again to reconsider the consequences of your statement, and I'll ask you once again, will you give me the assurance that you will step aside and peacefully do your duty? Thank you.
Graham. And it's my sad duty to, to ask you to step aside under the orders of the President of the United States. As a member of the Alabama National Guard, I've been ordered into the federal service this morning at approximately 10.30. It is my duty to ask you to step aside in order that the, the orders of the court may be accomplished. Gentlemen, uh, General, I wish to make a statement. Certainly, sir. Uh, <clears throat> but for the unwarranted federalization of the National Guard, I would at this moment be your Commander-in-Chief. In fact, I am your Commander-in-Chief, and I am the Governor of your state and your Governor. And I know this is a bitter pill to swallow for those in the National Guard of this state. I do want to say that I am very grateful to the people of Alabama for the calm restraint that they've exercised in this crisis in which we have faced. And I'm going to ask that all the people of this state continue to be calm in this matter. Because if you do continue to be calm and restrained, it will help us in this fight on the matter of constitutional principles. I admire the actions and attitude of the people of this great state. We must have no violence today or any other day because these National Guardsmen who are here today as federal soldiers are Alabamians and they live within our borders, and they are all our brothers. We are winning in this fight because we are awakening the American people to the dangers that we have spoken about so many times, which is so evident today, the trend toward military dictatorship in this country. We shall now return to Montgomery for the purpose of continuing this fight, this constitutional fight, because we are winning. We shall continue to work for a better Alabama for all the people of this state, both white and Negro. And it is my prayer that God above shall bless all the people of this state, both white and black. to the revolution of love. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. And he compares John McCain to this Democrat, George Wallace, a member of his own party. Oh, wait a minute. No matter what you think of John McCain as a senator, I don't think much of him personally. He was in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam when George Wallace was doing those things. He was in the Hanoi Hilton. How dare someone like Mr. Lewis say that? And I don't even like Mr. McCain. In other words, he's a racist himself. Then he says of Mitt Romney, and I certainly don't like Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is a Mormon. I don't agree with his beliefs. And he's an establishment Republican. I do not like Mr. Romney. But the fact of the matter is his family adopted black children. Black children related to him by adoption. Homeless black children that he took in and gave a life and education. And Congressman Lewis says Mr. Romney would bring back the days of segregation when he adopts black children and brings them up in his own family? Well, Mr. Lewis is obviously a liar and he's obviously a hypocrite. He's obviously no better than the racist thugs who beat him up in Selma. He's just a bigot the same as they are. He is what the scripture calls an Ebed Kim Loach. An Ebed Kim Loach. He begins as a victim, but becomes a victimizer. He begins as someone driven by principle, but then loses his principles once he gets power. Again, now if he was guided by scriptural principles in the tradition of Afro-American Pentecostalism or Baptist churches, if he followed that line, he wouldn't behave like this. But he just becomes another politician and a political hack with an agenda. You just think about it. In French, we say, le plus le change, le plus le reste même. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Under slavery, the Democratic Party of the American South, under slavery, they could vote 60% of their black slaves 
for the candidate of their choice with the assistance of collaborating blacks called Uncle Toms, they could vote 60% of their black slaves for the candidate of their choice. These were the Southern Democrats who ran the plantation system. Today, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Vote for who you're told for. You get a political Uncle Tom like Barack Obama or like Mr. Lewis, and they tell blacks who to vote for. Michelle Obama was recently on an Afro-American news station saying... And that's my message to voters. This isn't about Barack. It's not about the person on the ballot. It's about you. And for most of the people that we're talking to, a Democratic ticket is the clear ticket that we should be voting on, regardless of who said what or did this. That shouldn't even come into the equation. What is this? This is what went on in slavery. A black was simply a possession that you controlled politically. You determined who they voted for. Again, you look at the facts. Hillary Clinton, her mentor, Senator Byrd, an official, an official of the Ku Klux Klan, a high-ranking member of the Klan, who Bill Clinton defended as simply a good old boy. Uh, or George Favor, Bill Clinton's mentor, a storm segregationist, or Al Gore's father, a senator who voted against civil rights, or Jimmy Carter, Plains Baptist Church, segregated up until the 1970s. Southern Democrats telling blacks who to vote for. They're doing the same thing now they did in the age of slavery. It's the same party, the party of slavery, the party of Jim Crow. This is Evid Kim Loach. Evid Kim Loach. Just because they were the oppressor. I'm sorry, Slug. Just because they were the victim of the oppressor doesn't mean that they don't become the new oppressor once they get power. Because the power has changed hands, it doesn't mean policies are going to change. More than 50 years after civil rights, after the black right to vote, of which Congressman Lewis helped them obtain it, 50 years later, the socioeconomic plight of the average Afro-American or of Afro-Americans on average has not improved after 50 years. Why has it not improved since civil rights? Evid Kim Loach. They're no better than the people they once opposed. They're as much oppressors as the people who once oppressed them. Unless there is a turning to God, a revival, based on faith, repentance, second birth, regeneration. Unless the real values, the real values that gave rise to the civil rights movement, the faith that was held by people such as Booker T. Washington, unless that real, vibrant, second birth, regenerate faith becomes a reality, where black families would consider it a moral outrage to have children out of wedlock instead of three out of four of them being born out of wedlock, and then they make themselves the victims of white oppression. White men are not getting black women pregnant out of wedlock. I watched a clip on YouTube yesterday of an Afro-American who voted for Barack Obama twice. He's complaining that his lot has not improved since Barack Obama was elected and re-elected. He's earning $22,000 a year with a college degree, living in a trailer. Uh, there was one, he has three different children from three different women. Married to none of them, yet he makes himself a victim in his mind because that's what he was told. Unless you have the spirit of Jesus, his truth and his righteousness, you're going to have moral hypocrisy, moral breakdown. And it doesn't matter who wins the election. 
your lot is not going to improve. After more than 50 years since civil rights, the average black American is no better off than they ever were. Only they can no longer blame Jim Crow. They have to blame the out-of-wedlock birth rate among Afro-Americans. They have to blame their own leaders and own politicians who they voted for. Where does traditional Afro-American Christian values support same-sex marriage as Barack Obama did? Seven out of 10 children being aborted by Planned Parenthood are Afro-American babies being murdered in their mother's womb. Seven out of 10. Is this civil rights? What right does the baby have? When you look in God's word, killing babies in its mother's womb was the most horrific judgment imaginable. Yet they're killing their own babies in their mother's womb. The moral bankruptcy is a result of the spiritual bankruptcy. I don't care how much civil rights activism there is. I don't care how many Afro-American congressmen or senators get elected. It will not matter unless they return to the faith of their grandparents and great-grandparents. Things are not going to get any better. Their leaders are bigots, the same as the bigots who once oppressed them. Yesterday's oppressor is not today's oppressor. Yesterday's victim becomes today's victimizer. And that means you, Congressman Lewis, you're a hypocrite. I don't like John McCain, but don't tell me that when he was in the Hanoi Hilton, he was the same the same as George Wallace, your fellow Democrat. Don't tell me that Mitt Romney, and I don't even like Mitt Romney, is going to put the blacks back to the days of segregation when he adopted black children, when his family have adopted Afro-American children out of poverty and gave them a life that most black American children couldn't imagine. You're a hypocrite, Mr. Lewis. You are what scripture calls Evid Kimloach. Now, fortunately, a growing number of Afro-Americans seem to be waking up and facing the facts and the truth about these things. There are a growing number of Afro-Americans who have integrity. I love that congresswoman from Utah. I think her name is Miss Love. I love Senator Daniels. I love such people. These are people of integrity. These are people standing on Judeo-Christian values. These are people who are the true, true perpetrators of the heritage of their grandparents and great-grandparents. Ben Carson is a man of integrity and principle. Congressman Lewis has no integrity or principle. He left that way behind in Selma 50 years ago. Today, again, he's no better than those racist thugs who beat him up. He does the same thing. He's just a slandering racist. Evid Kim Loach. I desperately hope there will be an upward mobility among Afro-Americans. I desperately long to see them reach wage parity with Asians and with whites. I long for the same for Hispanics. But unless there is a return to the faith of their fathers, it's not going to happen. All you're going to get is another Barack Obama. All you're gonna get is another Congressman Lewis, Evid Kim Loach. My name is Jacob Prash, God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in the TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. 
But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print, the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Parpezzo, Parpezzo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.